when you're good. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are posting our master's degree admissions webinar. We hope to have some more people join us. And then again, we'll post this to the website for people to be able to reference later in the semester and into next year as they come across with some questions for admissions. So thank you for joining us. I did mention in the chat part that we will be taking some questions. So if there's some things that are on your mind that you for sure would like Ashley and myself to cover, go ahead and put those in the chat function. Later on, I'll allow the chance for you to unmute when we stop recording so that we can uh, let you converse with us whatever way works the best. Uh, but so thank you for joining us. It's October the 5th. We are already thick of admissions process and recruiting. I know Ashley's already starting with applications. So we're hoping this will address some of the questions that we're getting and offer some advice for you guys. So today joining us will be myself. I'm Catherine Meyer. I'm Director of Admissions and Recruitment here at the Bush School. I've been here about 20 years. Love working with our students. Recently, um, Ashley joined, us, me, joined our team about a few years ago and has been wonderful. She's the point person when someone starts to apply. So get to know Ashley pretty well. She'll be your best friend in terms of giving you some answers and some processes if you're running into troubles or don't know how to get something to upload or have a transcript question. Ashley Treadway is our Assistant Director of Admissions and is wonderful to work with. So the agenda today, this is what we're going to cover through the admissions process and timeline. I'm going to start the first section of just covering about grad school, the why and the when. Um, then we're going to go with preparing for the app process, some admissions advice for you in the different sections. Then Ashley's going to take over and start talking about the application requirements and timeline and what we expect after admissions, some processes you'll need to take care of. Then it'll come back to me with some average class stats and just a, a quick funding and cost consideration when you're getting offers from schools. So again, what's on your mind, be sure to ask us, drop that in the chat section or save that for later in this session. So we're gonna start with grad school, the why and the when. Um, a lot of times you'll get students who, one of their first questions, and it's a valid question, is when should I go to grad school? Should I wait? and work a few years and figure my path out before I come to grad school? Or are you okay with accepting those that have just graduated undergrad? And are we willing to take them at that time? And the question um, all comes down into, when is the right time for you? So we're gonna do a couple of questions here. First and foremost, does your intended career field need more from you? Right. There's some that once they gra graduate from undergrad, they may decide right then and there, you know, I want to go into the federal government. I want to work somewhere with one of the agencies uh, within Washington, D.C., for instance. And I'm going to go try my hand at that with just what I already have, because I don't know that I need to spend the money to go into grad school. And that can work for some people. But you need to do your research and find out. You may find out through trial and error that you can't get your foot in the door without having that master's degree. Um, you may find out there may be some skills that you haven't covered yet in undergrad, and you may want to go back and get some more um, knowledge, skills, and abilities to fill those needs. So do some research, and I want to cover that on the next slide. And know that that Grad school is more than just about the knowledge you're doing. It's also about the professional training and the connections that you're making with the faculty, getting some of those resources and connections through our career services office, and just expanding your options of, do I want an additional certificate in maybe some quant um, additional work? So there's a lot of ways to build um, that knowledge, and a lot of time grad school fills that need. Not everyone needs it, but a lot going into the fields that we work with find that there's some advantages of spending that time and money doing it. And then coming back to that first question I asked, the best time to attend grad school is when you know your focus. So if that is right after you graduate from undergrad and you know you want to do this and you're already in place in a certain location or your mentality is already ready for having done homework and you just want to dive into it, there's a lot of schools that will take you straight out from undergrad, but you will have to convince those faculty of why to bring you in. So be sure you know your focus because you're not going to figure that focus out in what we call in grad school, this is a sprint. 
it seems like you just started and suddenly you're graduating. So you're not gonna have a lot of time. Undergrad, four years, you got a little bit more. Here it's two and you gotta keep moving forward. So you may not have it all figured out as exactly what you wanna do, but you do need to have an idea knowing that I think I wanna do nonprofits. I think I wanna work with such and such energy issues. It can change when you're here, we get that. But you do have to have some type of, I'm not just here for, ah, it fulfills my next step. I'll figure it out when I get there. Faculty want to know more than that. And you need to sell them and how you're going to contribute to the classroom, right? So those experiences you've done, the passion you have for the field, there's a lot of things that go into creating those great essays. So one part I said was about researching your options and knowing your field and what they need from you. So I've put in a lot of very helpful websites, and these are utilized for public service professional organizations. So you can see that public administration, I would recommend that you go into naspa.org. Halfway down their first page when you land there is going to be a section on careers and, and pathways and schools that offer these kinds of degrees. So do your research at these kinds. The PPIA program is a great resource, and it works for both public admin and international affairs, where you can attend some junior summer institutes and get some quant help and listen to speakers. And those are a wonderful addition. But if you haven't done your research, you may not find it and you may not see an email about it. And they pay for you guys to go to some of those. So definitely utilize a lot of these websites. I'm not going to read them all off. I will say international affairs. APSIA.org is a wonderful one has all the top organizations and uh, university programs in the world, probably about the top 35 to 40 that are listed where you can go in and out of those websites and see which ones are a best fit for you. Nonprofit, state, local, federal, national security, and international economics and development. By no means this is all inclusive, but it does give you a start and you can come back and reference this later, take a snapshot of it um, and do some homework. Find out what these organizations recommend for you to have in these fields that you're interested in. As far as admissions and preparing, what makes you competitive? You're going to see over and over, it's aptitude for the field. Have you done well enough in your past experiences, in your classes you're taking, the internship, developing that, this is really what I am wanting to do, I want to make a difference in these issues? faculty want to know there's a good fit for it. So that aptitude, the past academic success. Now that can be more than just the GPA. And while GPA is important, as is you know the kind of major you're focusing on, the school that you went to, having a little bit of rigor, because this is no cakewalk in grad school. They are going to challenge you and there'll be a lot of reading, a lot of writing, um, a lot of opportunities to go past the classroom and go to classroom, uh, sorry, to uh, speakers, um, conferences. You're just wanting to make sure that you show them you can do grad level work. That clear sense of direction I talked about earlier may not stick with it, but at least in your essays, convey what you think it is you want to do, or even the region, the sector that you think you want to follow in. Maturity and initiative is huge. Make sure that you are showing, now we do an interview to help us with this, um, that people are ready for what they're about to undertake. And that if you end up getting in a class, for instance, quant methods is one of our first courses in both of our Master of Public Service and International Affairs. If you're struggling with it, you need to take that initiative and go see the faculty member or join a group with your fellow students um, to help you get through these classes. It's not just gonna all fall in your lap. You're going to have to take that initiative to push yourself, to get help when you need it, to go to those extra curricular activities and get to know your classmates, get to know the speakers and just find out more about what's out there. That's what these grad school programs are about. Can you work with others? A lot of the work we do here is teamwork. So make sure that you can talk about what you've been able to do in the past with um, projects and so forth. And you're also going to need support by your recommenders. Um, unfortunately, we still are having to co uh, collect recommenders. So we need those letters, those um, little checkoff sheets that tell kind of where you rank compared to other people they know at your age and, and in the classes. Uh, we need three of those. So make sure that you're lining those up 
And then as far as leadership and involvement, that is that step outside of the academic. Where have you been active? What are you passionate about? Um, just highlight those, especially on that resume and work on language and all those other parts. So in admissions, you need to make sure that you're highlighting your strengths. And I'm just gonna cover a couple of things. This includes relevant experiences, the contributions, your academics. So build your resume and your statement to highlight what those interests are. Now, for instance, we do get some people who tell us that they're looking for a PhD program. And we go, did you actually read our stuff? We're a professional program. While some might wind up in research, ours is more professional. So you want to make sure that you're tailoring that essay to hit that. Or there may be some questions that faculty will follow up during an interview to say, okay, what exactly do you need from us? Because we're not getting you ready for a PhD program. It's not a stepping stone for that necessarily. Um, you also want to look at your interest versus what our faculty offer here. So the, almost all these websites will have faculty directories. Look at the professors. Look at their past research. I am getting a lot of emails right now from students who are prospects who have reached out to faculty wanting to be their uh, GAs or their teaching assistants. And just realize some schools don't do that for incoming students. We're one of those. Others do. So make sure you're looking at that before you start hitting up all the faculty and you're not necessarily bothering them, but you're giving them another one that they're then forwarding to us. And I'm getting, you know, four or five from the same professors for the same student. So do some of your homework on that and talk about your interest. And then on your experiences, you're talking about the relevant work, the volunteerism, um, the study abroad, an internship or two that you've been able to do. Those are the things that help you stand out, that you've gone out and done something um, that maybe another younger student didn't have an opportunity to do. Sometimes some people are so intent on moving quickly through a program, maybe through a 3-2, and they're getting through their undergrad in two to three years, that they're not taking advantage of some of these opportunities that you did. So that can help you stand out. And as far as your abilities and skills, I've listed a few of these here, right? But if you can talk about your leadership, your, your time management, the, the practical training you've been able to do, all of these play some role. And we're looking for these kinds of things when we're interviewing and when we're looking over your materials. So the next few slides are going to be a, a couple of advice statements. I'm not going to try to spend a lot of time, but writing your personal statement, you should be taking some time on. This is a critical piece of just about every file, because this is the one place that you're describing your background and interest, and you're expressing your fit in your pro in, in, in the program of your choice, right? In your words. So we're wanting to know who you are, where you're coming from, why are you interested in, for instance, disaster management and maybe an energy policy. We just want to know who you are. So use this and be careful that you're covering what each school wants on their prompts. So if you need to break the prompt into sections and ensure you're answering it. I know a lot of you will take essays that you created for other schools and you'll just copy that and put that and start reworking it. If you do that, again, make sure you answered each of our prompts, which would be different from another school and take out the name of the other school. Be careful on that. It doesn't always sync your application, but it sure does give pause for a faculty member to go, oh, look, they don't even know what school they're applying to. So careful, careful, careful on that. And then take your time, have someone else read it, um, review it, and then come back to it. Don't make this something that you're trying to do in one night because the deadline's due. Give yourself a week, two weeks, tweak it, have someone look at it, but outline your qualifications, convey your passion, explain your goals, right? And those are typical pieces, but definitely look expressly on the website of what we want. Letters of recommendation, three letters are typical. We're seeing some schools now do two. Some have made it completely optional. For the younger applicants, the focus primarily for our faculty is to read what other academic faculty said about you. So typically, if you're still an undergrad, about to graduate, or been out less than two years, typically you want at least two of those to be academic. It doesn't have to be if it doesn't play to your strength but that's typically what they wanna see. 
Other options, if you don't have enough of the academic, is look at former employers, community mentors, student organization advisors. Sometimes we got military and they bring their personnel in to answer. So you've got all kinds of options to do it. But I will say, no matter what, you play to your strengths. Don't try to pull an academic of someone who doesn't know you or you didn't do well in their class if they're not going to give you a good letter or a detailed letter. It needs to be someone who knows you a little bit better. So the fewer professors are needed, the longer you've been out. Choose someone familiar with you, sometimes because you've taken multiple classes or you've done an organization where they're a sponsor and you've taken their class, something like that. And then supply each recommended recommender an updated resume, something that they can reference so they can pull that into the essay about knowing you, right? Your graduate career goals, let them know what program you're applying to, why, the deadlines they need, and then make sure that you're giving them the right kind of links um, for us, for instance, ours is pretty simple because it's all done through GradCast. So as long as you're entering that information, they're going to get the right um, materials for them to then upload back. And then as far as the GRE, this GRE is optional for both programs now. The Master of Public Service and International Affairs both have made this an optional piece. You can still take the test and later determine if you want to use them, um, but we're not requiring them. Really what we're saying is if you're below a 3.2 GPA for those two programs, you might want to consider doing them if they will help your uh, application. Or if you know you're a good test taker and you know this would be an additional credential that would help you stand out as a strong applicant, that's another good reason to supply them. Um, but we know that the test is, I put the cost, it's about $205 for most um, here and domestically, at least in the U.S. and many other countries. Um, but it's time and money. So we understand that. And if you choose not to do it, you are not hurt by that. But there is a, a nice little credential here. If you decide to take the test and you're not happy with your test scores, but you had them reported to us, just contact Ashley through that Bush School Applications email address that we'll talk about later, and she'll have them removed so faculty don't see them. We don't want you hurt by test scores, but we do want you, if you think they will help, go ahead and take it. And if you stated on the application that you're submitting them, but now you don't want to, again, contact Ashley so that we can move the file forward knowing we're not waiting on them anymore. If you do decide that you're preparing for the GRE, study for it. Please don't just go cold turkey thinking you'll be fine. There are some math portions you need to go and review some of the formulas you haven't touched since high school. Um, just being ready and familiar so you can do well if you're doing it. Each test vendor has free practice tests on their website. There's some good books out there at some bookstores. It's just the general test. So prep for it if you decide that you're going to do it. And I believe this is probably my last part. Um, no prerequisites are built into any of our programs, but you should have some familiarity, especially in the MPSA. They're, they're a quant heavy program. So you need to understand economics, micro or macro, or have a statistics class, or a research methods class, or a calculus, something where numbers don't scare you and you've got some foundation they can build from. That's not as important for the national security part of the MIA because they only have one of those courses, um, but MPSA has two or three of them. Um, if you're going into the IA with the IDEP, again, that's international development and economic policy. So economics is part of that. So micro and macro statistics, something um, would be helpful. All right, so there are some free resources. If you decide that you are a little rusty, this could even help for the GRE test. You can go to Khan Academy. Um, they're free online. They have pre-algebra, algebra, statistics, economics. Just start working through some of those before entry. And then again, spreadsheets, we all use them. Microsoft, creating your first Excel workbook, understanding some of those functions and just being ready for that. All right, I'm gonna pass this off to Ashley for a little while and uh, I'll come back in a little bit. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. So to, to start, I'm going to go over the application itself with you for each of the programs that we've been talking about. But to start, it, our two flagship programs, the Public Service and Administration, as well as the International Affairs degrees, both have a priority funding deadline of December 15th. December 15th means you're applying and making sure all of your materials are, are in to ensure you're considered for all of our funding opportunities. 
There are just a handful of opportunities that have deadlines in early January. So any application that's completed prior to December 15th is guaranteed to be considered. However, everyone has until January 12th to get any last minute materials or to submit a late application or on the later side, um, you'll still get a, a scholarship or a funding amount of some sort. It's just those two opportunities you may have missed out on if you didn't complete your application prior to January 12th. So I always tell applicants strap for December 15th, that if at all possible, January 12th gives you some extra leg room in case recommendations don't come in, those type things. But both of these degrees are two-year degrees that we admit students for uh, in fall entry only. We do not offer spring or summer admission, so it's once per year for fall. Um, the required materials are going to be an application in GradCast. Um, that's just the graduate central application system. And through GradCast, that's where you will upload and submit all of the materials listed below. So that's going to be your resume, your personal statement, your international experience essay if you're applying to the international affairs degree, transcripts from all four-year colleges or universities attended. We do not need community college transcripts or um, transcripts from, let's say, a dual high school credit. I get that question a lot too. However, if you did take courses at Texas A&M, then transfer over to the University of Texas, even if those credits transferred in, we still need transcripts from both of those colleges. Additionally, recommendations. Um, this is all collected electronically. So you'll enter the name and email address of three recommenders. The system automatically nof notifies your recommenders that they have been asked for a recommendation. So make sure you talk to your recommenders prior to adding their information in. Otherwise, they'll get that notification and delete or not have any idea what it's for. So talk to them before you do that. And then if you're an international student and you're from a, a a citizen from a non-English speaking country, we do provide, provide uh, require proof of English proficiency. There's a list of ways, um, GRE verbal scores of a certain level, TOEFL scores of a certain level. So just look on our website. We have those minimum requirements and upload to your application. And then if you're electing to submit GRE scores, even though they're completely optional, you, there will also be a place for you to upload in your application. So one tip for you guys is when you are ready to submit your application, you don't actually have to wait until your recommenders have submitted their recommendations. Instead, what I, re I advise you to do is submit your application as soon as you've got all of your parts done. Um, it will come to me and then I'll let you know, hey, we're waiting on three recommendations. You can always log into your application and check the status of those recommendations. You can send reminders, you can change out your recommenders, but that just ensures you have the application in, you're just waiting on recommendations, just monitor them to make sure they come in. The um, next step in the admissions cycle for these two programs is the admissions committee reviews all completed applications at the end of January. So we all come together, make those decisions on who we're gonna invite forward to the next round of the admissions process, and that is interviews. You do, if you're invited, are required to complete an interview with two different faculty or staff members. And we urge and recommend um, and encourage applicants to attend interview conference weekend if you can. We'll offer Zoom interviews for those that can't make it. Maybe you're in a different country or you have a, another obligation. But during interview conference weekend, and we have these two dates listed up here, there we do partially reimburse you for all travel expenses. We feed you while you're here, but also you get to interact with faculty members, alumni, current students. You get to visit with different organizations, student organizations that are here, learn about the curriculum, meet with a department head. It's a well, it's a very busy weekend, but that is key into learning everything you need to know about this degree and seeing if we are the right fit for you. So interview conference weekend isn't just us interviewing you. We want to make sure that you see yourself here too. Then in early March, after all the interviews are completed, we come back and do a final application review for a decision as well as a scholarship or funding decision. And our goal is to have offer letters out um, with those scholarship decisions by mid-March. March 15th is kind of our cutoff deadline for us. Then you have until April 15th to accept or decline that offer. 
just know that if something does come up like a, an emergency situation or something you didn't expect and you need to roll your admission over to the next year, we do have an option for you to request approval to do so. In extenuating circumstances, the departments would allow you to move forward a year or roll it over for a year. So that's for those two programs. I'm gonna switch over to our Master of International Affairs and Public Health combined degree. Has very similar application deadlines. So we still have that priority funding deadline of December 15th and a final application deadline of February 1st. So a little bit further out than the January 12th deadline. And that's because we're working with the MPH degree to co uh, coordinate those admissions decisions and the admissions process. This is a three-year degree where you apply to MPH and IA at the same time, but you start in the MPH program for the first one and a half years. And then the second one and a half years, you come over to the Master of International Affairs. So your first step in applying to this is to submit an online application through what they call a SOFIS application. Just like everything that I had previously went over in the previous programs, it's a very similar application. You're gonna upload all of your materials to that application. And as soon as you submit that application, you turn around and submit an internal application to the MIA. The Master of International Affairs requires just a few more elements that the MPH does not. That's why we have to collect it kind of separately. Um, additionally, if you want to tailor your personal statement or your resume to international affairs and it be different than your MPH resume and personal statement, we recommend you upload that to your internal application. We'll consider those instead. Otherwise, if you don't, don't upload it. I'll use what's on your MPH application. Um, but just know that the personal statement prompts are different between the two programs and the resume. Some people want to put, you know, if they have security clearances or language experience, that's not necessarily necessarily applicable to MPH, but it is to IA. Um, you can do that as well. Hey, Ashley, before you move on, can you cover someone asked about the international experience essay and what we like in that? So it, it would be for both, you know, MIA. Yeah. So the international experience essay, that's a great question. And I skipped right over that, but it is very similar to the personal statement, but different in that we want to know specifically what is your exposure? What triggered your interest? Why, why international affairs for you? Have you studied abroad? Have you traveled abroad? Is there a specific country that you've been studying? Just tell us kind of what is your background in international affairs of any type? Have you um, maybe you have family or maybe you are from a different country. We're just trying to get a baseline of what your experience is so far up to now. Okay, and I did have one more. There's uh, someone who's asking, they already have a master's degree. Shall they present the university and master's degree transcripts? Yes, all four-year college transcripts, regardless if a degree was earned or not. So the MPH, uh, MIA admissions timeline is the exact same as it is for the MIA, except the only difference is whenever we email you that offer in mid-March, it's going to contain an offer letter from the MPH department if they've admitted you and an offer letter from us if we've admitted you. You can be admitted to one but not the other program, but you can also be admitted to both. Um, just know that you'll have to accept the offers to both or one, whichever you would like. And then the app requirements for our last combined degree with the Master of International Affairs is the Master of Science and Economics combined degree. This degree, you will actually apply to um, the Master of Science and Economics first. It's a three-year degree, you apply to the economics, and if you're admitted in the fall semester of your first year is when you will would apply to the Master of International Affairs internally. And that's where you'll provide that internal application, it doesn't have a fee, the MIA focused resume and personal statement and the international experience essay. Everything else will pull from your economics application. If admitted, then in your second year here at Texas A&M, you would start the Master of International Affairs. And then in your third year, it's kind of confusing, but you'll split the, the third year. One, one semester with the econ department, the second semester with the international affairs department. Um, but same uh, priority MIA funding deadline is the same for all programs, December 15th, um, January 12th is the final application deadline. 
for our last degree, the Master of International Policy. This one is different than the others in that it requires you to have at least four years of full-time professional experience in international affairs to even apply. So it is an executive level program and that is a hard requirement. If you're on the cusp and you're not quite sure if your experience qualifies, you're more than welcome to email me a resume and I will take a look at it with the department head and try to figure out if you, if you are qualified or not. Just know that if you've served any time in the military, that does count towards international uh, affairs experience. We admit for this program every semester. So spring, summer, fall, whichever in term of entry you want. Um, we have the same application deadline for each term each year. So for spring, it's going to be October 15th. Summer is March 15th, fall, April 15th. It is a one-year degree. We do not offer any aid or scholarship scholarships for this program because most are funded through their employer or, or some means they're sponsored by someone. Um, so just know that we do accept federal financial aid, military benefits, anything of that nature. Similar to the other programs, you would submit an application through GradCast, a resume, personal statement, transcripts, recommendations. We only require two for this program. And then GRE is completely optional and proof of English proficiency. The admissions timeline for this is much quicker. We do not require interviews for this degree. Instead, once I receive a completed application, meaning all materials are in, all recommendations are in, I send it on to the admissions committee to review. And then seven to 10 business days later, I have a decision and I'll notify you via email. And then you have 30 days from whatever date that is to accept or decline your offer. Now, let's say you are admitted and you accept your offer. What now? What's next? I cannot stress the importance of going ahead and requesting your official transcripts be sent to Texas A&M University Department of Grad Admissions almost immediately after you accept. The reason is you will have a hold on your account preventing you from being able to register for courses and registration opens two to three weeks after we send out the offer letter. So there's a short turnaround time between that time. Um, so submit them, make sure they're in. It can take two to three weeks for them to receive and process transcripts, especially if they're mailed and not electronically delivered. So an electronically delivered does not mean email. It means an online secure service that they have to um, send the transcripts through like uh, Speedy or National Student Clearinghouse, something of that nature. Um, also submit your official English proficiency test scores if, if you've done that as an international student or that's how you want to prove your English proficiency. And then after that, you register for a class. And throughout the summer, we uh, connect you with current students. We make sure that you're on track to enter and start the program with an orientation the week prior to class starting. Okay, you back to me? Yep. <laughs> okay, so I've got a couple of slides to wrap up with some stats and just a reminder, but reminding your, you've got a lot of choices and we understand that. Uh, the benefits of a program like the Bush School uh, with offers those Master of Public Service and the Master of International Affairs are two bread and butter programs is we are part of a major research university and all the accolades that come with it. This wonderful picture of here of a dean Welsh, who's now the interim president of Texas A&M, and he was targeted because he is such a wonderful public servant and knows how to run organizations. So we've got this small school environment with the Bush School, where we're bringing in anywhere between 170 to 190 students a year uh, between our programs. And that's 80 to 100 between the MPSA and the MIA. Um, and so you're getting a good mix of not only your classmates in your degree, but you're sharing those experiences with people in another degree that might have different outlooks, different goals. Um, and it just exposes you to so much more and you get to learn from your colleagues and your environment. The classes here are small. So we're looking at most that max out between 20 to 25 people. So average, I've put around 16. I've known several that have only been five to seven. So you really are getting that close connection with faculty. And it is then putting a lot of responsibility on you. You've got to come to class prepared. 
and having done your readings and be ready to talk and discuss and I don't know if debate's the right word, but you're coming in there to really learn and hash out these um, ideas. So be ready for that kind of environment because you're learning not only from our academics who are subject matter experts, but we have a great mix of seasoned practitioners, people who've been in the field, maybe a foreign ambassador um, who's done all of his life, 20, 30 years in that field, who comes back, an intelligence officer, someone who ran nonprofits, another one who's you know, a government employee. And they're coming in and talking about the kinds of writing you need to do, the kind of connections you need to do, how you need to speak. Uh, you're going to learn that from them. And then this is a competitive enrollment. So it's merit with experience and fit that are going to be decided upon as we're deciding who to admit. And right after that, how much money we can offer to students. So I'll cover this in a second about funding, but we will cover everyone with something. You just can't get a full ride here unless you're one of the couple of exceptions and they've got to be domestic students. Again, GRE is optional. Most cases, in, in this case, nearly everyone is not going to submit them. But if you think it can help you or you've got a lower GPA and want to do it, please think about that if it can help, especially sometimes with scholarship considerations. Um, it's nice to have that additional credential. Not mandatory, though. People still get great scholarships without it. So incoming class stats, this is on the website under the admissions section. Um, but enrollment, you'll see the MPSA fell a little bit below their goal of that 80 to 85. Some of that's because some of our international students who are admitted can't necessarily get their paperwork in order or their funding doesn't come through because they know we're not giving them everything. So they are trying to line up outside scholarships. So 75 for MPSA, MPSA 93 for the MIA. Now, the MIP that Ashley talked about earlier is rolling admissions. So between the fall and the spring, so far we've got eight. We'll expect that to probably have a couple more in by summer. Average GPA, this doesn't fluctuate much. Usually our average is between a 3.4 and a 3.65. Um, but you'll see MIP is a little bit lower than that. But again, they're bringing in their experiences. So that's more important uh, to faculty so they can make up for that. The women percentages, the students of color, those are very robust. Um, we work hard to have diversity here in our classes, um, international students, same way. The only reason those numbers are as low as they are is because of funding and whether students can afford here. We admit a lot more than this. We're not trying to be exclusive and put people out there and say, no, oh, we can't hold those international students. We want them. But most of the time, we can only fund part of it, which I'll cover in a second. Um, and that just puts more pressure on students to find their own. Non-residents, typically this is more about 40 to 60% either way. Um, Non-resident for MPSA, we're much more Texas heavy this year. Uh, we've seen that the last couple of years. We'll, it'll, it'll be cyclical. It'll change and we'll go the other way again and have more non-residents um, outside of the school. So average work experience, uh, zero to two years. You'll see with the MIA, we had quite a few who were admitted straight out. They were some of our strongest students. So don't let the hey, I need to go work for a couple of years. It's great if you have it and that works for you, but it doesn't for everyone. And we're willing to take them if they're the right kind of student. So you can see those numbers there. You'll notice MIP, all of them have to have that four to five years experience. So this year's class is 100% for that. But that differs from year and out. All right, so my last part here before we're gonna stop recording and take some questions, funding and costs. So as a reminder, it's great to be admitted. But when we send you that admissions letter, we are also telling you what your funding is. So here's how we work. The Bush School offers scholarships, and that means you don't have to work for it. So in year one, every single student who is telling us they're going to be a full-time student, they're going to receive some level, level of funding. We're going to start with our top awards, those full funded awards. There's only a couple of them, and they're only open for domestic students. We'll give those out first, and then we start working our way down our uh, levels. So with the MPSA last year, that was actually 20000 The top level for the MIA after those full awards was a 15000 And then we go to ten, and then to 7000 and then to 5000 to 3000 And then sometimes we run out, and we still got a couple more students we need to fund, but we've got to go to the $1,000. So that is what you're being put into your letter of how much you're getting in year one. 
If you are an out-of-state student or an international student, you get an additional statement that says, we will also provide you a non-resident tuition waiver, which means you don't have to look at that higher price tag because we're going to now get you down to a closer uh, amount that's within three to 4,000 of a Texas resident. So we're gonna help you with that. Two thirds of our incoming students received around three to 5,000. So if you can get more than that, that's great. But we only have so many of those that we can give. And then I know I'll get a lot of emails from students, Ashley does this too, where they'll come in and ask, can you reevaluate me for it? And, and we don't, we don't do competitive. Someone else gave you more money. I have to just say, sorry, you're gonna have to take that. I can't reevaluate funds. It was given by faculty in a committee. Um, we can't just then put something more on top of it. So just keep that in mind. Some schools allow you to negotiate. We do not. Um, those scholarships will be renewed in year two if you maintain at least a 3.25 or better. Or the only way you can change that funding is to apply for a graduate assistantship. We have those available to second year students. They're just not available to first years. So those graduate assistantships, they're going to be advertised for non-teaching or for research, and you would apply for them in the spring of your first year, and then you'll know around May or June if you've been given one of those. If you were not successful in landing one of those, then you just go back to whatever your first year scholarship was renewed. You can also look elsewhere at Texas A&M. We have a great red website and resource is Jobs for Aggies. And across campus, people are putting jobs in for GAs or, or, or maybe even TAs. Um, and you guys can then apply for those grad assistantships. Um, or you can apply for a student worker position. And if your visas or if your uh, schedule allows for it, you can then try to work your way through college as well and maybe pay some of your bills through that way. Now, in the summer, between your first and second year, you may have to do an internship. And if you get one that is unpaid, then you would be able to qualify for some internship scholarships that are offered through the Career Services Office by attending a number of their workshops. So we are trying to help you with some funding. It's just not going to be as much as everyone would like. Um, and so we're trying to be fair. We're trying to really get down to the nitty gritty when we're interviewing and we're reviewing your files and just trying to fit who earns this merit of these top awards. And we'll do that as best we can. Now, as far as the cost goes, these estimated tuition and fees, this is before the scholarship and before that non-resident waiver. So as an example, if you look at the MPS and MIA for the Texas residents, we run $13,500 per year. Now you get a $10,000 scholarship. That means out of your pocket, you're responsible for about $3,500 plus, of course, the living costs. If you're a non-resident, that waiver that's worth $12,700 plus your scholarship will knock you down close to what the Texas residents are. And if you're an international student, you'll notice you're a little bit more expensive because you've got some international fees and insurance you have to cover. And so it's always about $4,000 off of the others. But again, much more reasonable once you apply those scholarships and that waiver. MIP is a little bit different, but you can see what those totals are. And in that case for MIP, you're not getting the scholarship and you're not getting waivers so that is the cost you would pay. So it's a little bit different in terms of how we work when, and function with funding. So be sure you're working with the institution that is admitting you, compare those prices, uh, find out what kind of scholarships that you um, can uh, qualify for. So with that being said, I'm gonna give an opportunity in just a second, we're gonna stop the recording in a minute, but I wanna go through. If you have any questions for us, Ashley and I are here to help. She's better at answering the phone than I am. <laughs> but a lot of those emails, we both split between that Bush School admissions at tamu.edu that comes to me. She's got one that's Bush School applications at tamu.edu. And that is all over the website when you start to apply. That phone number rings in both of our offices. And so we are here to help. And there is a ton of wonderful information that actually has been a lot of time developing that is on our website that goes step by step how to apply. And if you run into any questions, you just 
pick up the phone or email her and we're happy to cover that with you. Now, the last part of this is we do still have three more upcoming events. Um, well, there's more than three. The career services is next. So Matt Upton's gonna come in a couple of weeks and cover about jobs and what we can do. And then I'm gonna cover financial aid and what graduate school, financial aid, FAFSA, um, loans you can take out, options. It's more than just what the Bush School does. It is more general. So if you want to learn more about that, attend on November the 8th. And then I'm giving overviews, which is everything all in one little compact one on October 30th, November 28th, and December 13th. So if you haven't already heard one of those or want to hit it, then you're going to get information for that. But we also have chat hours where people just drop in and ask us questions. And we've got open houses if you find yourself in your Bryan College Station. So just take a look at that events calendar on the website. Get in touch with us. Ashley and I are here to help. So having said that, Ashley, if you'll turn off the recording, we're now going to open this up and see if anyone has questions for us.